my name is Tom Wadsworth, and uh, the title of this thing has, has changed several times. Uh, the, the last version that I decided on several minutes ago is The Assembly. Uh, you may have seen it under different names in the paper or, or wherever you saw the, the title of this thing. It has, uh, uh, I've had several titles that were somewhat more offensive and direct and blunt and in your face, uh, but this is, seems to be the least offensive. What um, going to church in the New Testament? And I should, uh, or here's another one of the alternative titles uh, is How We Got Worship Wrong. And uh, I, for, for a lot of folks, them's fighting words. I get it. So, but uh, uh, sheath your sword and uh, keep your gun under wraps for a while. And uh, let me finish what I got to say, and then maybe we'll be, we'll be a get out of here safely. Uh, this is what we're th the things we're going to be doing in the next seven weeks. Um, why the early church didn't have worship services is the title of tonight's presentation. Uh, number next week is the real meaning of worship in the Bible. Uh, and I suggest that it's significantly different than what any of you have ever heard, including pastors. So uh, the temple that changed everything, that's sort of the theological center of what we're going to be doing. Uh, October 25 is why they didn't preach sermons in church. Now, that's going to require some definition to those terms, preach and sermon. So, so don't get too upset just yet. Wait till we get there, and then you can let me have it. Uh, November 1, we're going to talk about worship wars and the biblical role of music. That's still a hot topic and not as hot as it was 20 years ago, but it still is. Uh, November the 8th, how the church later developed worship services. This one is maybe my favorite of all these presentations, and it will explain how we got to where we are today. Took me a long time to figure that out, but I've, I think I've got there. And the final one is the biblical purpose of going to church. Uh, what I want to emphasize is what this event isn't. Um, it isn't a church service. It isn't an attempt to gain disciples or increase church attendance at my church because I don't have a church. Uh, I'm not trying to uh, start a church. I'm not going to do it. Uh, the to make money because this is free. I even bought the cookies. <laughs> so uh, I, I paid for the room. You know, I just uh, this is just me uh, having some what I feel are some dramatically revolutionary biblical ideas that I've got to get out. I just simply got to get them out. And you're my first victims. Uh, on a public level. It's true that I have preached some of these concepts over the last 40 some years uh, in bits and pieces and uh, little segments of it. What really has been going on in my, I first stumbled on this 45 years ago and I'll explain that here in just a minute. But uh, I continued to study this concept about worship and how it isn't there in the New Testament as pertained to worship services, as we would think of it, and got to studying it more and more and more, getting deep into the Greek text, getting deep into early church history, getting deep into first century culture. Um, and then finally, six years ago, I decided to uh, take these conclusions and start a PhD program in New Testament and wanted to see if, uh, if these ideas would hold up through a PhD grinder at uh, one of the uh, best known evangelical, biblically oriented uh, seminaries in the country, which is Midwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Kansas City. And I finished my dissertation and graduated with a PhD just uh, about five months ago in, uh, in uh, May of this year. So uh, the ideas held up and they are, they're not opinions. I don't think. I think they're just rock solid biblical truth. And yet I suggest also, as you will soon find out, that they are significantly different than probably what you have ever heard before. Uh, so that's what this isn't. Um, it's really just sort of a public lecture uh, to which the public is invited. And we're going to have time at the end 
to exchange <laughs> thoughts and ideas, ask questions. Then you can uh, object to some things and you can say, but what about this verse and what about this idea? And you completely miss this Wadsworth and that's when you can do that. And feel free also in the middle of this thing to, uh, to describe uh, uh, your questions or, or to ask anything you've got on your mind. So that's what this isn't and that's what this is. It's really, it comes from a conviction that Christianity ought to be based on the Christian scriptures. You know, if, if, if it isn't, then pretty much anybody can do what they want, right? Well, I'm a Christian, but uh, we do it this way, and I like the, I prefer the, I pre well, okay, but uh, this comes from a conviction that uh, what we have in the New Testament documents are the Christian scriptures, and they are uh, the, uh, the blueprint, if you will, for what we do as a church today. But there's been 2,000 years that have passed since those documents were drafted. Uh, they have gone through thousands of miles of cultures and a couple thousand years of culture change and it passed through different languages through the years. And it's inevitable that some things that were there at the beginning are no longer there anymore. And I think that I've stumbled onto something here. So let's, let's uh, maybe also put this somewhat in perspective with um, where this country has been in the last three years. This illustration appeared in Time magazine just uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was a big article they had entitled, What We Learned from the Pandemic. The pandemic applies to what we're talking here today because of images like this. Uh, this is from Christianity Today, where churches, well, nobody was in the churches for a while because you couldn't have church services for several months there in early 2020. And it forced pastors and church leaders to figure out what are we going to do? And a lot of churches ended up looking like this, with people spaced out in their pews and a lot of people missing. And notice uh, this particular thing there. There's a camera out there in the middle shooting what's going on here and then broadcasting this and streaming uh, what's happening in church to the people at home. This is another view of sort of the same kind of thing, but obviously there's nobody in the audience except for this guy over here, the tech guy, who, who's doing the camera work and streaming it on Facebook or whatever it is. But this was a very common thing uh, uh, not so long ago, and even still to this day still is there, except now there's a few people left back in the pews. But as a general rule, most churches have lost a lot of people in the process over the last three years, because once people get out of the habit of going, you know, they kind of stay out of the habit. That's happened a lot to a lot of churches. Some churches have been fortunate to regain their former strength in the pre-COVID years, but that's not common. Uh, so, but this whole experience of COVID and the pandemic uh, forced several questions upon us. One of them is, what are we doing in church? Pastors had to say, okay, what's, if we're going to stream this thing, what's really important? Why are we doing this? What are the elements in what we're doing that we can eliminate? And what are the essential parts that we need to keep. But it basically forced every pastor everywhere on the planet, because COVID was a planetary thing, to rethink what church is all about. Now, fortunately, I've already been on this quest for some 40 years prior to that. That all goes back to, uh, well, here's another issue. By the way, this was in Christianity Today Online today a new article they just published called What We Lose When We Live Stream Our Church Services. Now that question needs to be asked. What do we lose? What's missing now that was there in 2019? What is some new stuff there that doesn't need to be there or that really should have been there all along? All kinds of questions can be asked, but we're being forced to ask and look at those questions now. So the title of this presentation is Why the Early Church Didn't Have Worship Services. Uh, bear with me. I'll explain that in a minute. I know that doesn't sound right. My journey on this goes back to Sunday, October 30 of 1977. I was in my first year of preaching. 
at the Averill Avenue Church of Christ, Flint, Michigan. Uh, I'd been there since June when I got out of seminary. And I decided to preach through 1 Corinthians because it seemed like this book had something to say to that particular church in that situation. And I, by the 14th week, I came to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now, if you, some of you remember the late 70s and what the church culture was like at that time across the country. But at that time, speaking in tongues was a highly contested issue. Uh, some churches were absolutely forbidden to do it, even though there's great pressure to do it. Uh, but I came across 1 Corinthians chapter 14, which talks about extensively speaking in tongues. And I kind of knew that if I addressed this issue, I was in for trouble. And so I was actually tempted, let's just go to chapter 15. And it, it talks about the resurrection, and, and people won't disagree about that, so we moved on. But I, I said to myself, there's got to be something in here. There's 40 verses in 1 Corinthians 14. There's got to be something of value in this chapter. And I found that a certain Greek word starts to get repeated in this chapter. It's the Greek word oikodome. I, I know you don't know what that word means, but it means edification. Can be also translated as building up, to build up one another, to edify one another. And that word appears in various forms seven times in this chapter. And it all comes to a conclusion in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, where Paul says, What then is the outcome, brothers and sisters? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation, all things are to be done for edification. That's the word oikodome again. That pops up again for the seventh time right there in this verse, where Paul is coming to this big conclusion of his entire argument for the entire chapter. The question hit me as I was scrambling to get my sermon together late on a Saturday night, October 29, to get ready for the next morning where is worship in this thing? Because all my life I had been taught and believed that when you get to church, you go to God. After all, you have hours of worship, you have a house of worship, you open worship with a prayer, you then close worship with something, you ask people, where did you worship? Well, last week we worshiped over at and we have an order of worship we pass out. We have a worship team. We have a worship leader. There are worship services. We talk about our acts of worship, and we talk about acceptable worship. But the question had to hit me, where does that come from? All that language, all this worship language, where did this start? If it's not in the New Testament, where did it come from? Because when I was preparing my sermon, for October the 30th of 1977, I looked up every time the word worship is found in the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. Every one. Does this apply to what people do in, Christian, in a Christian church on Sunday, in their meetings? Every time. And then I looked up all the times that uh, uh, church meetings are discussed. And the word worship is just absent. It doesn't apply to what Christians do in their assemblies. This blew my mind. And I, uh, I got up the next morning ill-prepared, and I said, we don't gather together to worship God on Sunday. Now, that was kind of a badly worded statement, and some people felt I was, number one, a heretic, and number two, a false teacher. And I was uh, accused of that um, strongly. Uh, luckily, I kept my job. But I was in something going on here in the Bible that I haven't had a full time to, to explore and figure out what's going on biblically with this topic. But there's a distinct difference between the, our terminology and first century terminology. We talk about going to worship and all these other things that I described a minute ago. But they talk about coming together in assembly. They talk about house churches. 
They, they didn't go to buildings, you know, a special sacred building in the New Testament. They usually gathered in houses, not exclusively. They didn't talk about worship services. They had, they had assemblies. Matter of fact, the Greek word for church is ekklesia, which really means an assembly. An assembly. Uh, the assembly of God at Corinth. It's the people gathered together in that location. It doesn't refer to a building. And if you've been around the Bible very long, you know that that's, that's uh, very commonly understood. They gathered to break bread. They had elders and teachers instead of a worship team and a worship leader. Again, I'm not saying this stuff over here is wrong and you're going to hell if you have it. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to figure out what, what's going on in the New Testament. Uh, instead of acts of worship, they had activities that edify. Read through 1 Corinthians 14, 14 for example. You're going to see where Paul's saying, do this because it edifies. Don't do that because it doesn't edify. And one of the reasons why speaking in tongues is inappropriate in a Christian assembly is because other people are not edified when you're talking in other language. The only way it does get to be appropriate in a Christian assembly is when somebody interprets it because when interpretation happens then edification takes place people get it they understand what the message is they learn they are benefited somehow edification takes place instead of the idea of things being done for acceptable worship here the last thing paul says let all things be done for edification we'll talk more about that passage uh, later so in my study, I found this thing, what I call the worship anomaly, this strange thing about the Bible. And that is that the New Testament does not use worship terminology to refer to the Christian assembly or to its activities. Just let that soak in for a minute. Uh, don't reject it out hand. You, you're going to want to reject it. I'll talk about reasons why here in a little bit too. But... Let that soak in, because uh, you can do the search yourself. Look up all the times the word worship is found in your Bible. I don't care what version you're using. Uh, you're going to find what I said is true. So my investigation uh, that I did for my uh, doctoral dissertation uh, attacked this issue uh, in different ways. Uh, first thing, one thing you got to do when you're doing a dissertation at a doctoral level is you study scholars assessment of whatever it is your topic. And I scholar studied what scholars have been saying about this anomaly, about why isn't worship language there in reference to Christian meetings in the New Testament. And I studied a lot of them. We'll talk about them here in a minute as well. The second phase of that was then to go into key New Testament passages that talk about the assembly, the Christian assembly, about going to church that they use to refer to this thing we call church and what people do in church. Greek words that are translated as worship, and it turns out there's several of them, which tends to really complicate the matter. It would be great if there's just one Greek word that's translated as worship, but there's actually several, and here they are here. I'm sure you know all of them. <laughs> Uh, but we'll talk about these next week. And by the way, I know it might be a little off-putting to think you're going to talk about Greek words, and I don't know Greek. But th this study that I did to get into deep detail on each one of these words, not just studying every time it's found in the New Testament, but every time every one of these Greek words is found in the Greek Old Testament and in intertestamental Greek literature, mean and once I found out uh, it blew my mind blew my mind and uh, you may be wondering if I really know what I'm talking about by now and I get it because you might be wondering hasn't somebody somewhere noticed this before that the New Testament does not use worship language to refer to going to church Surely somebody somewhere, I can't possibly be the first person on the planet to find this in his Bible. Well, as it turns out, I'm not. And when I did this study of what scholars have been writing about worship for a long time, I began to find uh, several scholars who had stumbled on this. They were baffled. They weren't sure what to do with it. But let me 
show you what some of these guys were saying. The first time that I could find in the literature uh, a scholar reflecting on this idea was in 1952. Not before then, but in 1952, a German scholar named Gerhard Delling made this statement in his book on worship in the New Testament. He says, primitive Christianity, in marked difference from the religion of its Greek environment, attached no importance to the external framework of its worship. We hear nothing of the use of visible symbols, nothing at all about the arranging the room, etc. That cannot be a matter of chance. Now you've got to understand Delling. Delling is a Lutheran, a German Lutheran, writing in 1952, and he's accustomed to there being uh, you know, rather... Uh, sacred, uh, ceremonial, uh, dignified church service. That's why he puts a capital W on worship. I mean, that's what he thinks about this. It's, it's a capital word. Uh, and so, but he says, he doesn't notice, by the way, that the word worship is not being used. But what he notices is that some of the other things that go along with a worship idea are missing. Like he says, we hear nothing about visible symbols being used in the assembly, like a cross, for example like an altar, uh, none of the arranging the room with you know, stained glass windows and pews and a narthex and a nave and all these other things that we might have today, all those are, are, are gone. They're not there in the New Testament and that's of no surprise to anyone. But uh, he's surprised at this and he says, it can't be a matter of chance that this is absent. Well, about the same time that Delling was writing, there was another scholar named Peter Brunner, another German scholar, another German Lutheran scholar, writing about the same time. His book is called Worship. But the New Testament didn't allow him to use that word to describe what he was doing, what he was studying. And he just goes, I don't get it. But he goes ahead and uses the word worship throughout the book and just proceeds as if everybody knows what worship is and, and it goes ahead, which these scholars ended up doing. Here's another scholar from 1959, Edward Schweitzer, a Swiss scholar. He says, it's very significant that nowhere in the New Testament, the usual terms of the cult, which is sacrifice, offering, and worship, are applied to the assembling of the church for its services. Things like that. In, in New Testament scholarship, cult refers to the ceremonial and ritual aspects of, well, what we call worship, the cult. That's cultic activities. Uh, sacrifice, offering, and, and uh, worship. He notices that the word worship is missing in the New Testament to refer to these things. And he says it's very significant. He doesn't know quite what to do with that. But he just says, but it's really significant. But I get it. Uh, Bo Reiki, here's another German scholar uh, writing in 1959. He asks, actually asks the question, does not worship have any importance to the New Testament authors? His mind is blown as well. Why in the world would Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Peter, James, and John, and, and all, all these guys have no emphasis on worship as we know it applied to assembly activity? Why is that missing? Doesn't it have any importance? I'm a scholar. He understood it as well. He didn't know what to do with it either, but he just says, what is going on here? Moving on through history, in 1975, uh, Urban Bishop in the Restoration Quarterly had an article called The Assembly. To the New Testament. I completely agree. He nailed it. He's got it. He actually figured out something about what this means. 
uh, in that article back in 1975. I stumbled on this same thing in 1977, uh, same kind of thing, but all these guys had been there before I was. Here in 1980, a guy named Robert went to church primarily to worship. Not once in all his writings does he suggest that this is the case. Robert Banks is a really interesting character. Um, he had got his PhD in New Testament from Cambridge University in Cambridge, England, uh, one of the finest New Testament uh, seminaries in the world. Uh, he was an Anglican going into the program, an Anglican priest, mind you, but he got to studying this stuff. He actually left the Anglican church after that and moved to Australia where he became the head of this long uh, house church movement. And uh, uh, Robert Banks is still alive to this day. He's in his 80s. I've corresponded with him a number of times. Uh, but he's still solidly convinced that this is, this is the case, what he said there back in 1980. The most significant article that was written on this came from a guy named I. Howard Marshall. And if some of you are familiar with New Testament literature and the big names in, in scholarship back in the 80s and 90s and 2000s, I. Howard Marshall was the king. He was sort of viewed as the, the dean of evangelical scholarship uh, on the planet. He was the editor of Evangelical Quarterly for 25 years. He wrote this article entitled, How Really Christians Worship God? Because <laughs> he found out that worship is not an umbrella term for what goes on when Christians gather together. He makes several statements in this article, which will blow your mind, but he, he's dead on correct. A remarkable oddity. Another guy, David Peterson, writing in 1992, he said, contemporary Christians obscure the Bible's teaching on this subject when they apply worship to what goes on in Sunday services. Uh, I, Peterson compelled me, uh, his writing was, was compelling to me, and I went to and had a chance to sit down and meet with him. And, uh, uh, that was a, a real gentleman of a guy and uh, uh, excellent scholar, and he'd written extensively on this topic. But uh, that was uh, a great experience. Uh, but he also is stumbling on this same concept. Uh, John Richardson, a guy who had read what Marshall had said 10 years earlier, and it blew his mind, and he writes an article about 10 years later in Churchman Magazine, says there is no such thing as worship as we know it. Again, a real blunt statement. Moving again through history, later on that same year, Streeter Stewart in Evangelical Quarterly, this is Marshall's uh, uh, journal, uh, scholarly journal, he says, worship associated with particular acts or practices done at particular locations as we are accustomed to think. As is something's different going on here in the New Testament. Everett Ferguson in his book in 1996, said it would be better to speak of church as the assembly or some such word to describe the congregational gathering of Christians. He realizes that this word worship is missing the boat somehow. It's just not right. It's just not biblical. We need to come up with a different name for what we do in, in, in assembly. And you're going to hear me use that word assembly a lot because Biblical term that helps, helps to orient our brains to be thinking uh, in New Testament terms. Um, now, the interesting thing happens after 1996. Silence in the scholarly literature. Almost nobody is talking about the worship anomaly, as I have called it. The fact that worship language is absent from all these discussions of Christian meetings in the New Testament. It's gone. And my guess as to what's going on is this whole <coughs> praise and worship music explosion that took place in the 90s. And that's when worship wars began to erupt in the late 90s and early 2000s when churches had uh, a, a early service would be the traditional worship and the late service would be the contemporary when they'd bring in the drums and the guitars and all that stuff because the churches were fighting over this is issue for a long time. But I think since worship language just began to just pervade everything that churches were doing at that time, to try to talk about the assembly 
without using the word worship just didn't fly. It didn't make sense. People couldn't get their heads around it. And so this, this idea, this worship anomaly, leaves the literature for a while until 2000. A scholar at Yale uh, writes this book called Ancient Christian Worship. And he says something at the very beginning of his book. He says, we've got to admit something difficult at the outset of this book. In the ancient world, what we now call worship did not quite exist. The unfortunate thing about his book is that even though he admits it didn't worship, even though the New Testament didn't. Uh, and I'm not saying he's going to go to hell for that. Uh, I'm just saying things get really confusing when you start to use that seven-letter W word in a way that the Bible does not. Um, as I also looked at all these things that all these guys were saying, they all, they all applied a particular adjective to this problem. And here's a list of them. Reiki called it a striking fact that the word is absent. Delling said it was surprising. Schweitzer, it's astonishing, startling. It's remarkable. It's very significant. It's strange. It's puzzling. It's something difficult. They all recognized that this is a real, odd, strange issue. What do we do with that? I, in my PhD program, I had several classes where I would be writing papers uh, on this for different classes and then presenting these papers to my fellow uh, doctoral students and I would get done with and they would look up at me and three times in three different classes with three different papers one of the first questions out of their mouth was what does this mean <laughs> right that's probably what you're saying right now or another guy said what do we do now <laughs> and I get it and that's where I've been for 45 years. What does this mean and what do we do now? Well, I suggest it is a significant issue that does require a, a, a whole new fresh look. In some ways, I find that we're something like we've buried ourselves in this burrow tunnel underground. And here we are. And we've got to find a get our way out of it so we can see the light of scripture in daylight. But we've got to find our way out of there. Dig around around the holes, go to different ways to finally look for some daylight until we finally get up and out of here and look fresh, look fresh at the scriptures, not with 21st century eyes, but with 1st century eyes. As my old seminary professor in Memphis used to say, when you read the New Testament, you need to put on 1st century glasses and not your 20th century glasses. Uh, because if you start to look at this stuff, uh, from our perspective, you're, you're just not gonna understand what's going on. <clears throat> but I found some bonus findings as I went through all the literature studying what all these, these scholars were saying. Here's one of them. The liturgical scholars now acknowledge that the common assumption that the New Testament is filled with references to Christian liturgy is, quote, more like wishful thinking or the unconscious projections back into ancient times of later practices. Paul Bradshaw said this. Paul Bradshaw teaches liturgical studies at Notre Dame. Uh, he is, a, I believe, an Anglican priest on staff at Notre Dame, a Catholic school. Uh, but his liturgy is his field. Uh, liturgical studies is his expertise. And he has studied this and written several books and articles on this for a very long time. But in 2002, he made this statement. He says, what we've been doing and assuming they had liturgy in the New Testament, it's just wishful thinking. We're, we're doing anachronism. We are making unconsciously projecting back into ancient times modern practice. Oh. Here's another benefit or bonus finding that this. Synagogue scholars are now realizing that first century synagogue activity was not then described as worship. Uh, by the way, here's a, I got this book today called Worship in the Early Church. It's by Justo Gonzalez, uh, who is a, a world renowned uh, uh, expert in historical theology. He's written a ton of stuff. He's in his 80s now, 
but he wrote this book on, on worship in the early church. But he talks about first century synagogue worship. But the problem is, uh, there's no evidence that at that time, Jews viewed what they did in a synagogue as worship. This is a case of us, even Christian scholars, as well as Jewish scholars, taking modern ideas of what happens in a synagogue or in a church and thrusting it back into the first century, making, it think, making us think that they're doing the same thing then that we're doing now. So that's one of the problems with this worship terminology. So my, my investigation did these two things, studied the scholars' assessment, then I analyzed key passages about the assembly in the New Testament. Let's, let's see if this really works, I said. Uh, let's look where the, the Bible talks about Christian assemblies and see how it talks about them. And I looked at 15 different passages, and they are listed here. Uh, I'm going to show them all to you. Uh, some of these you will be familiar with. Most of these uh, you, you might think uh, you're familiar with how it talks about Christian assemblies and, and a lot of these different places. Um, and, but I did an in-depth analysis of the Greek text of, of all these passages, and this was part of my, my dissertation. And the, the net result of all of that is that only two of these passages did have worship language, but in both cases, the term did not refer to congregational acti activity as we think of worship. And one example is right there in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I mentioned 26 as this big conclusion, but verse 25, Paul talks about the possibility of an outsider coming into the Christian assembly and being so impressed by what's going on that he falls on his face and worships God, declaring that God is truly among you. But if you understand what that word is talking about, the falling on his face and worshiping God, the word worship is a bad translation there. He, they fell on his face and he prostrated to God, declaring that God is truly among them. So the word worship does appear in the context of a Christian assembly, but number one, it's not something that any Christian did. <laughs> it's something that a non-Christian did, and it had nothing to do with him singing songs or saying prayers. It had to do with him prostrating himself. He fell on his face, which is a common thing you say before you use this particular Greek word. We get into that more next week. So that was one of the results of this study of the assembly passages. And another result was that most of the congregational activities that are found in the New Testament could be described as horizontal activities. What I mean by that is in teaching, exhorting, uh, encouraging, strengthening, edifying. They are one-to-one, -one, person person-to-person activities. As a, well, there are a few activities, though, in the New Testament that could be described as vertical, like singing, where you're praising God, right? It is legitimately a New Testament biblical idea. Nothing I've said should make you think that I'm, I'm against praising God. You know, that's just, that's just not it. There's a different point I'm making here. But some of, these, some of these activities in the early assemblies were vertical. And praying would be obviously something that Christians do to God. It's a vertical thing. But for the most part, if you study all the passages in the New Testament, figure out what's going on in these assemblies, you'll find out that largely this is a horizontal event where they are bouncing off each other and talking and encouraging each other. Tom, there's one place in Scripture where it specifically refers to singing, and that's when the meal was over, before they went out uh, regarding the assembly. Right. After they sang a hymn. Right. Right. This is at the, uh, the Last Supper. <laughs> This is a Jesus Last Supper. This, it's not technically a, a church event, but it is, it is where the disciples were gathered around before Jesus had uh, died and, and crucified on the cross and was resurrected. But yes, they did sing a hymn. And we find that Paul in prison in Acts chapter 16, what is he doing with Silas there? Singing a hymn, same thing. Colossians 3.16 and Ephesians 5.19 talks about singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It's probably indeed a reference to a congregational activity. 
So there is singing. There is vertical activity going on in assemblies, right? We're on, we're on the same page there. Thank you for that. So, oh, back up. Uh, the other key result of uh, this study of assembly passages was this. 1 Corinthians 14 is a gold mine of information. And yet it has been skipped over, largely, I think, because of controversies related to speaking in tongues. But we got to take another and clearest biblical passage that talks specifically about what Christians are supposed to do when they get together, what their priorities ought to be, what the goal of what they're doing ought to be. It's right there in Scripture. We don't have to make assumptions about what somebody is writing and then apply it to something, uh, to Christian assemblies. Here, Paul is commanding about Christian assemblies. We got to listen to what he's saying. I think he's got something there. Um, so the third aspect of my investigation was this, and that's to study these, these five Greek words that you see there on your screen. And so I could summarize what I found out there, basically, is that it is questionable whether any of these five words should be translated as worship. And if they are translated as worship, they sh it never is meant in the sense of what you do in church. It's got some other connotations. We get more into that next week when we study that issue. But I think that's an important conclusion to share with you now. And that all five of these words refer to various aspects of temple activities, both in the Jewish temple as, as well as in pagan temples. Now there was such a thing as Jewish worship. There was temple worship, but when the Bible talks about worship in the temple. What is it referring to? It's generally not referring to people sitting in pews and singing songs. Matter of fact, it never is referring to people sitting in pews and singing songs. But it is talking about people doing something in the temple. But it's something different with each one of these five words. We'll talk about that more next week. But the temple becomes a significant focus of our investigation, because that's where worship language. As you know, Jesus in Matthew 24 predicted the destruction of the temple. And he never said that you're going to start building new church buildings to replace the temple. No, 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 no. That's not what he said. Uh, well, let's continue on here. And this, this last point is also important on these, this issue of worship words. The sacrificial death of Jesus nullified the need for the temple and its activities. So in a way you could say, explain this, but let me state it bluntly and succinctly. When the temple goes away, the biblical concept of worship goes away. It's not to say that we don't praise God anymore. I know that we tend to atta attach the word worship to praising God, but none of the Greek words do that. It's a different concept going on. So I know you're all scratching your heads right now. That's why I've got seven weeks to explain this stuff because it really takes a while to get into all this and figure out what's going on in the New Testament. I find that there are very, various barriers to understanding this stuff. And I actually see the, I can see the roadblocks in, in several of your minds right now. And I've been there for years, so you have my deep sympathy. But stay with me. I think if, if once you understand some of these barriers to understanding, then I think it may help you negotiate ways to get around it and figure out what the Bible is saying on this stuff. One of the barriers involves terminology. I've always found it helpful to use <coughs> biblical terminology to refer to biblical things. But when we use non-biblical terminology to refer to biblical concepts, we're going to be confused from the beginning. Maybe an example of this is, um, well, the word church. Uh, it's well known that never is the word church used in the Bible to refer to a 
that. There's, there's no such thing as a church building in the Bible. Church refers to the body, to the assembly, to the group of people. Uh, but when we, if we read our Bibles and we see the word church and we think that that word church is referring to a building, we're going to be very confused and we're going to come to wrong conclusions. That's what is going on with the word worship also. Terminology becomes important. Anachronism. I know this is a big, long word, and some, probably not a word you use today. Uh, but it's the error of reading modern concepts back into the New Testament text uh, that's going on with regard to the synagogue, where scholars are assuming that synagogues in the first century were doing what later synagogues were doing. And we're doing the same thing regarding churches. We're assuming that the first century church meetings were doing the same things that we do today. But that's a problem. Uh, on this issue, there's several scholars who have talked directly about this issue of anachronism, especially when discussing Christian assemblies in the New Testament. D.A. Carson, and if you, if you know New Testament scholars today, D.A. Carson is probably the the number one uh, most uh, popular uh, scholar taught at, at, at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in, uh, in Deerfield, Illinois for a long time. I'm not sure if he's still there, but he's written tons of stuff. He says, we unwittingly read our ideas and experiences of worship back into scripture. Exquisite confidence we know jolly well ought to be there. That's anachronism. That's anachronism. There's another guy, David Own, who is uh, another worship scholar who wrote about this in 1992. He says, scholars have shown a marked, scholars have shown a marked tendency to read early fragments anachronistically. They're taking modern ideas of what happens in an assembly and assuming that that's what's going on in the first century. This problem of anachronism bothers scholars as well as real people, so you're not alone. And uh, ironically, David Owen, uh, in this article that he wrote on this topic, I found places where he was doing it himself. Uh, and I bet you I do it. Uh, it, it's so difficult to get our head out of our 21st century experience and to sink ourselves back into the first century. So another barrier to understanding here is this interesting term. I ran across this in an article in 1959. Pan-liturgism. What they meant by that is the error of finding liturgy in the New Testament even when it isn't there. That there was a whole thing going on in the, in the 50s and early 60s the ecumenical movement was underway. Uh, Vatican II was about to get underway in the early 60s. And there was attempts to be made between how do you get Protestants and Catholics together? And one of the problems of doing that was what happens in church. Catholics have their way of doing things and Protestants have their way of doing things and they just couldn't get it together. But these studies went to find the problem with these studies was pan-liturgism. What he meant by that is they're finding everywhere in the New Testament places where liturgy existed, but it didn't. Uh, again, it's reading back into the New Testament later stuff. When I say liturgy, what I mean there is um, using uh, rote recitations and procedures, uh, ceremonial ritualistic uh, patterns in the way you conduct a church service, that's liturgy. Uh, some churches are high liturgy today. Some are low liturgy. These, these are called high churches. Some are called low churches. And in many ways, even to this day, churches can't get together because of this, this uh, difference between them on the issue of liturgy. But I find that the, the problem here was they're seeing liturgy in the New Testament when it, when it wasn't really there. They're reading later practices into the New Testament. Another problem that affects this issue is sacralism. And what I'm thinking is this is, 
is to regard the activities of an assembly as holy or sacred. And virtually any church does this. Have you ever gotten your church stuck in the pattern of three songs and a prayer, followed by you know, the communion or followed by the collection? Or, you know, you, we automatically, there's something about human beings, when we get into this thing we call a worship service, what we do becomes sacred. And it becomes hard to change. And we got to get around that and to be able to look at what's happening in the New Testament afresh. Now, if the New Testament wants us to view these things as sacred, let's let the New Testament teach us that. But let's not just say that all this stuff cannot be changed and it This is an ongoing problem, sacralism. And then a final one is, is the issue of definition. One of the things you may have been thinking already is that um, this whole issue of worship depends on how you define worship. But I found that if you define the English word worship, it's an unproductive effort. What really needs to be done here is to define the Greek words that are found in the New Testament. It does not help to define an English word. Greek words. And what we got to figure out, what the definition of key aid to understanding these things is to get your head around the idea of a house church. That's what the common experience was of Christians in the New Testament. They gathered in people's homes. They gathered in the living rooms. They sat on the floor. If they had a couch or something, they would sit there. There'd usually a meal involved in these things. They go out in the back courtyard or whatever kinds of homes they had and facilities they had in these homes. Uh, put your head in those situations. There's several passages you probably greet Prisca and Aquila in the church that is in their house, Romans 16. The same church and the same house is referred to in 1 Corinthians 16. In Colossians 4, Paul says, greet Nympha in the church that is in her house. She's got an assembly right there in her house. Uh, Philemon has a church in his house. Uh, in 2 John chapter 1, he says, if anybody does not bring this teaching to your assembly, don't receive him into your house. Uh, there are several more passages besides these. Uh, so, so most of us have not had a house church before. But do church, some things start to seem really strange. You don't expect the minister to come on, come in wearing a robe with a hot, tall hat and swinging some incense. Oh, here he comes, everybody, everybody stand up. <laughs> Wait a minute, this is, this is somebody's house. I'm not trying to ridicule people who do that. I'm just saying some things just don't seem right in a house church situation. Uh, if, we, if you inject a great deal of formality and ceremonialness into the assembly, of what a house church may have looked like back in those days. This one caught my attention. You see men and women, some old, some young, some kids, and they're just sitting around uh, talking and, and discussing stuff. Uh, I don't see pews. There's no stained glass windows. There's no tall spires. There's uh, no altar. There's no, they're just folks getting around for a gathering. If you can set your head inside of that of, of, a, of a culture, that kind of a setting, then a lot of the New Testament stuff begins to make sense and get ourselves out of our pews mentally. I'm not saying you're going to go to hell in pew. It's not what we're saying. Uh, but we need to get our mindset 
we got to take the stained glass windows out of our minds and the tall spires and the golden crosses and the flowing uh, and all that stuff, get it out of our minds, and then we begin to understand what a Christian gathering is like. The most important to refer to when Christians got together is the word gather. Okay. Uh, synagogue. That's what synagogue means. It's a gathering. It's an assembly. The word ecclesia that you've heard So, to answer this question, which we started off with, why didn't the early church have worship services? Well, here's the answers, I think. Number one, well, they didn't perceive their meetings as worship, and that's clear in the New Testament. They didn't perceive their meeting as services. The word service doesn't appear in reference to what Christians did in their meeting. They saw their meetings as formal ceremonial events. Uh, Paul demanded that all assembly activities focus on building up one another, which is primarily a horizontal focus rather than a vertical one. So largely, not entirely, largely these meetings. There is another Greek word that's used 110 times in the New Testament. The Greek word is alelon. It means one another. And it's used in conjunction with a lot of other verbs like comfort one another encourage one another, exhort one another, teach one another, counsel one another, forgive one another, be gracious to one another, pray for one another, confess your sins to one another. That's in the Bible too. All this one another activity, this is Christian activity in assembly. So a couple of illustrations to maybe get your mind around comparing them to us. In the Bible, they had edification. Today, we have worship. In the Bible, they had one another. Today, the focus is on the minister, because you can't have a church without a minister, right? He's got to be there to do his thing. One another. The horizontal was the focus then, not a ver vertical focus back then. And back then, the focus was on the body of Christ, the people, the gathering, and not on the building? Again, I'm not saying but we need to get our heads straight. So if we put this together in sort of a visual image of comparing the two models, the worship model would look like this. If you go to church to worship God, then the building kind of essentially becomes holy. That is the place where worship is offered. It is a house of worship. It is the house of God that must be respected and it then becomes service that to God. There shouldn't be flaws and mistakes in it. It should be beautiful from start to finish. And then finally, the worshipers need to be reverent and no running in the church building. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you, you got to be very respectful and reverent as you sit there uh, in church. But that's the worship model. If you follow the idea that we're there to worship God, these things kind of naturally follow and they have throughout uh, Christian history. But if you have an edification model, which to my knowledge has never been done, I think some things become different. The building is purely functional. It's, it's actually optional. I mean, what has a building got to do with it if really the focus is on one another? I mean, you can have a building. It's kind of great to have one. Hate sitting in the rain. But... Uh, well, you just get our priorities straight. The building becomes functional. The meeting becomes edifying. It becomes something that people gain something from, that they're growing from. They're better this week than they were last week because there was interaction. There was content being shared. People were benefiting and growing. And then finally, the, the people are maturing. Uh, that's what's happening with the people. They don't just sit there and, and are reverent the whole time until they get out and run to, the, to their car in the parking lot but the people are maturing. The end goal of the edification model 
is the people of God become better. They don't just stay in the same place and be real worshipful for the rest of their life. They get better. Just imagine, how different would you be the church? The focus by you and by everybody else was to build up one another. Now let's get better. Let's encourage one another. Let's help each other. And that's the focus, the stated focus. It's the priority that everybody knows. It's echoed from the pulpit, which is another non-biblical entity, by the way. Uh, it's, uh, but how different would a person be if after going to church to build up one another for 40 years? But if they go for 40 years where their goal is to worship God each week, well, they'll be real worshipful after 40 years, but will they be any better? Now, they might be. They might be. But again, what does the Bible say we ought to be doing? And I think that's where I've been here with this message. 